<clears throat> Hi. Okay. So I'm going to be speaking to you tonight, just get used to this microphone, <laughs> on uh, uh, deep learning frameworks. Um, you know, I hope you're all prepared for deep le a deep learning framework talk. Uh, if you read the meetup, you will be. So um, I will start straight into it. I will launch straight into it. So um, basically, we're going to spend the first two thirds of this talk talking about um, concepts around deep learning, which I hope will be reasonably useful uh, to you. Um, and then the last bit of the talk, we're just going to have a quick look at some of the deep learning frameworks out there, uh, some of the open source deep learning frameworks. So uh, I hope that meets your expectations, and then we'll take questions at the end. Okay, so the first thing I'll say uh, is um, the first disclaimer, uh, if you're expecting maths and code, there's going to be none. Uh, this is just about concepts, which some might argue is kind of the hardest bit to get your head, head around. If you understand the concepts, uh, it's always been my way of learning things, then you know, it's quite straightforward to put it into mass or to put it into code. So th this won't be, that, that, that's my next talk, come on and see that. So tonight it's all about concepts. The big picture, um, so tonight we're going to be talking about deep learning frameworks. So the big picture is um, there's something called AI artificial intelligence. Um, so, you know, what is deep learning really? Um, well, deep learning is neural networks. Uh, what are neural networks? Well, the bra your brain is a neural network, right? Um, so, the big picture really is this um, thing called artificial intelligence. And if you don't worry about the word artificial, right, the, bi the big picture is intelligence, okay? So we're actually building intelligence these days, funny enough. Uh, using these things. Um, so, you know, the big picture is cognitive architecture. So, there's more, what I'm trying to say is there's more to this thing than just uh, neural nets or deep learning algorithms. Um, you know, there's this thing called intelligence, which um, uses neural nets, um, it uses deep learning, but it also uses other things too, right? Uh, if our brain was that simple, Right? would have cracked it by now, but it's not. But deep learning is, um, it's, you know, a very, very, very good start. And, you know, we're kind of on the way, right? We're on the way to kind of solving intelligence, but we're not there yet. Okay. Uh, then we've got the machine learning frameworks, um, which I can divide into supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning. Okay. So our brain works. Um, whether we, you know, kind of think about it or not, uh, everything we do falls into one of those three categories. So, supervised learning is when we have labeled data, where we have stuff that is taught to us. We have, um, when we're children, we, you know, have parents, we go to school, and we're taught stuff, okay? That's labeled data. We're taught, we're supervised by our parents and our teachers. We also stumble around the world ourselves, like with little babies, babies crawling around on the floor, bumping into stuff. That's unsupervised learning, there's no one there. We're just learning. We learn as we go, trial and error, right? And, uh, and we do it, you know, right through life. You know, it's not someone just holding a hand, I'll go out and try something new on my own. That's unsupervised, you yeah? know? And then there's reinforcement, which is good old fashioned, uh, you know, reward when we get something right, and a penalty when we make mistakes, okay? And again, you know, that happens right throughout life as well. So, machine learning frameworks um, basically encompass all of that, but if we do it on a computer, okay? And then, finally, the deep learning frameworks, uh, there are the bits that we're gonna look at tonight. Those are specifically neural networks, okay? And there are two types, there are biological neural networks and there are artificial neural networks. We're looking at the artificial type tonight, which are a heavy, heavy, heavy approximation of biological ones, because uh, the brain is quite complicated. So, I hope that puts that in perspective. Um, so, I've kind of talked about this a little bit, what is deep learning? 
Um, there's lots of words. I mentioned biological neural networks. I mentioned artificial neural networks. Um, so what is a neural network? Well, it's basically a layered architecture of nodes. And on each node, you might want to call that a neuron, okay, in the brain. But each of those nodes does some kind of calculation. Okay, so basically, the, 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 the setup is this. We have data, right? We live in a world where agents operating in an environment, where people living in the world, and we just, we have a constant flow of data, whether that's vision, uh, you know, pho photons hitting our eyeball, our retina, uh, passing through this layered uh, network of neurons in our, in our cortex, okay? So deep learning is the artificial approximation of that. Um, you know, it could be sound, uh, sound waves hitting our eardrum, again getting converted in the cortex. Surprisingly enough, these two seemingly very different processes, uh, sight and sound, vision and hearing, uh, the neural networks are exactly the same. So the actual information processing is done the same way, whether we're listening to something, if you're listening to my talk now, or you're seeing me, okay, in the brain that's being processed uh, by the same architecture in the same way. So the physics is the same, the mass is the same, the code is the same. And so deep learning architectures um, are all about that. So we've all heard of DeepMind winning at Go. Uh, yeah, uh, there's sort of, yeah, we'll, we'll get on to more specific. I mean, you know, I could end my talk now. Yeah, you all know about deep learning, biology, and artificial neural networks. There's obviously a little bit more to it. So yeah, we'll, we'll dive down a little bit deeper and see. There are actually different uh, deep learning algorithms, different neural net types of neural networks, depending on whether it's, uh, you know, vision or hearing but the actual architecture is the same. It's the same layered network. So that's that slide. Um, you know, think about it in terms of a layered network. There again, supervised, unsupervised reinforcement learning. Google have it in a hundred of their products, and they're, you know, the world's biggest company by market cap today. So perhaps deep learning is something we should pay attention to. Perhaps not, but perhaps it is. Um, so here's an evolution, okay? Uh, it didn't start from nowhere, so it has a history, and that history goes back to 1943, uh, when two gentlemen, McCulloch and Pitts, uh, Pitt, they decided to, well remember like computers were just starting in like the late 30s, early 40s, and these two gentlemen, basically the genius was that, okay, um, we're gonna make a mechanical model of the brain, right? Uh, they saw these computers and they said, okay, if we can make a mechanical model of the brain, then we can make a computer that does everything the brain can in the next five or 10 years. Well, okay, so it's 73 years later, we still haven't done it, okay, they're a bit optimistic, but, they had that first thought, which is the important thought. So they are kind of credited with starting this whole ball game, if you like. Artificial neural networks started with these guys. You can read their paper, it's online, download it. Uh, so then there's something called the perceptron, where you know they did the mathematical, basically, formalism. Uh, obviously, no one's really done it because the brain's really complicated, but they, they did, they wrote down some different equations to um, say, this is how information is processed. This is how everything is processed. This guy here, uh, Frank Rosenblatt, 1958 at Cornell, he actually built what they wrote down. Uh, and he, he built a layered network. He built the first neural network in 1958 at Cornell, called it a perceptron. Uh, so that's kind of when it was built. Um, I, I, you know, I, I'm going to skim over this stuff. But that's kind of where it started from. Uh, the rest is kind of algorithms, um, you know, the software that, that got more and more sophisticated. We've got the neural networks, um, RNN and CNN are the two, two, two different types of neural network. Um, the recurrent neural network is for um, data that comes in a sequence, like vision, like market data, and the CNN is uh, for images. Um, there's no time element to it. 
So those are the two main um, different types of neural networks. And the rest are kind of little landmarks. Um, these are all papers, these are all people who, who came up with the ideas first, like Jeff Hinton came up with something called the Restricted Boltzmann Machine, which is a type of neural network in 1999. He now works at the University of Toronto, he now works at Google. Um, they bought his little company, just as they had bought a lot of little companies from academia, as had Microsoft and IBM and Facebook. Um, so yeah, it's a good, good thing to be a, a professor in a deep learning department right now, because you'll probably get bought out by a lot of money. So, uh, and so on and so on, right? So up until today, 2016. Um, so yeah, we're in full swing with the deep learning um, companies and deep learning, putting it into practice, building code. So the rest of my talk is gonna be on kind of the concepts behind it. Um, so I hope that gives you kind of a high, high level flavor. Now what we're gonna dive into a little bit to these concepts like res restricted bolts and machines and things like this. Okay, so um, that, that's just a title slide really. We're not really gonna look at that. It's just a title to what your appetite. So, as I mentioned earlier, uh, data sets, uh, so there are data sets that exist. Uh, people have built them over the years. They exist on the web. Uh, you could, uh, some of them are open source, some of them are not. A couple of um, some of the more uh, famous ones, if you like, are the MList, which are a set of digits here, which uh, you feed into a machine. There's 70,000 of them. And, um, you know, someone's put them together, handwritten digits. Another one's called Label Faces in the Wild, which is, uh, uh, I think it's 13,000 faces. Um, some are duplicates that machines can look at and do things with using these machine learning algorithms, these neural networks, these deep learning algorithms. So we start off, we don't have anything unless we have something to feed in, right, to the machine, into our brains. The processing happens with these deep, deep learning algorithms and then something is output. And uh, that could be a classification, we could classify that as a face, could be a cat, the famous example of Google recognizing a cat, the Google brain, uh, without anyone telling them what a cat was. It could be, this is a number nine, and the machine knowing that's a nine, okay. So these things aren't self-aware, but they're intelligent, okay. Self-awareness is another level which we won't be talking about. So we're just looking at um, basically feature recognition, intelligence in that respect, okay. Not really about the machine being self-aware. Or I've seen a nine, or you know, I've recognised a face. You know, that feels that feel. You know, I feel something. Although you know, as silly as that sounds, it's sort of something that people are considering as well. When, when will these machines become self-aware? You know, if we've got a neural network that can do everything else, suddenly it becomes okay. So what you know, what does it mean to be self-aware? So you know, it kind of gets a, to these deep questions quite quickly. But so far, you know, none of the machines, as far as we know, at Google or IBM or any research lab has um, become self-aware. Although, I mean, it's something I'm interested in, you know, what, what is that thing that will um, create self-awareness? I think that's, that's, a, that's a reasonable question to ask today. It might not have been 10 years ago, but I think we're probably getting kind of close to be able to ask questions like that sensibly. Okay, so, so here's our um, lead network, okay? That's a multi-layer perception, perceptron, and um, that's just like a diagram. Again, there's layers and nodes, just going back here. So here, here are the nodes, here's a layer, here, here are the nodes. These nodes correspond to neurons in a biological, uh, in their neocortex. So these are um, multi-layer perceptron. So the data comes in here, okay? incident on this layer, gets processed one layer at a time, and, and, and comes out at the output. And if this was a face or something, what you'd see here is kind of like pixels would 
the incident here, and then it would make uh, uh, the next layer of abstraction. It might see lines, and then this layer, it might see shapes. This layer, it might see the whole image and context of the background if it was, a, say, a person, and it would output person. Or if a, cat, a set of pixels representing a cat came in here, again, it would lines, eyes, cat, output cat, if your neural network was working. Okay, so that's kind of what's happening. Sounds fantastical, but that, that, that's how it works. And that, that's how the brain works. That's how our brain processes, processes this information as well. Okay, so we have layers and nodes. Um, now, each of these things here, these connections, right, these are like, uh, in the brain, the neurons, um, axons, and the connections between the neurons is about, we have about 100 billion neurons in the brain and about uh, 100 trillion connections between the neurons, and um, so there's about 1,000 of these per, per neuron. And it's the same thing here. What, how, how this thing works is by adjusting the weights of these uh, connections between the um, nodes or neurons, and uh, the, the weight will actually determine if that's a cat or a dog or a person. And in the brain itself, once you have tuned this to a cat comes in and, and the output is a cat, the actual, these weights won't change, they will change, you initialize them to any initial value, and then it will converge, and we'll see a little bit how that converges, how we set these up to converge. Once it's converged, these weights won't change, and in a sense, that's a memory, that is a memory, and that's how it works in the brain too. Um, so these connections here, uh, basically, essentially, is what a memory is, in fact, okay? So it's quite interesting. Uh, to map it to the, to, to the actual brain, I think. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so the activation function. So I mentioned softmax here. So each one of these nodes has an activation function in it, each and every one. It could be billions of nodes in a big neural network, and it could be dozens of layers, you know, the, the big uh, Google network and other companies like that. Um, you know, so in each, okay, so that's just kind of, you need a lot of processing power. But within each node, each single node will have an activation function, which is like uh, the letter, it's a sigmoid, or a tan age logistical rectilinear unit. I don't know how many people, I can't assume that, you know, you did math at university or whatever, but um, if you have, you recognize these as, as this shape of function here. And what that does, that takes a value between negative one and one, can't, can't go outside of that range. So that normalizes the information coming in between minus one and one. So the information comes in from the weights, it's summed. If it's above a certain threshold, it allows it to pass through. If it's not, if the signal's too weak, it will drop it. And so that uh, path will not be activated. If it is above a threshold, it will be activated and that will strengthen that connection. Which is, kind of, which is how it works, okay. Um, so this activation function is basically a sigmo sigmoid. This rectilinear unit here, that's what the uh, ReLU stands for, for, is actually a, it's between zero and one, so the shape of the graph is a line on the uh, x-axis and a 45 degree angle, so it's not, it's not quite that. And the reason they do that is because it converges quicker. They found, I mean, for many years they used these sigmoid functions, and then someone said, yeah, let's try a rectilinear unit function, and it worked so much quicker and more efficiently and better. So people, this is kind of like a standard thing today. People don't really use sigmoids in 10H anymore uh, in the last five years. There's a little bit of history for you. Um, yeah, the softmax function is just the function at the activation function at the last layer, and it's the same shape as well. Okay, so that was that softmax normalized exponential. Uh, so it has a special name. We give a special name to the activation function on the output layer. We call that the softmax function, but it's simply that. Okay. Right, so it's these things, the signals are optimized. 
um, that by different algorithms. Um, and what we can find is that if we're not careful, we can overfit. So if we have, um, you know, when you have, say, 20 points on a line, it's a curve, and we try to fit the curves for every single point, uh, that's not a very intelligent thing to do. It's not very sensible. You know, maybe a parabola, so we want a line that doesn't fit for every point, but the points clearly are in a straight line or a parabola. Well, in a multi-dimensional space, which this is essentially, um, we're fitting surfaces or hyperplanes, okay? And so we, 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 we can do the same thing. We can overfit. We can try to fit through every single point. I'm abstracting now in that, that layered diagram into a mathematical abstraction. But what we're doing is essentially fitting a hyperplane through a set of points, okay? Uh, you know, that, so that I said no math, so I'm not going to write up an equation. That's, a, that's essentially what this process reduces down to. So to avoid overfitting, we can do, um, there's, there's regularization, cross-validation, dropout. These are, we'll look at these, uh, a method of avoiding overfitting. Okay, so this is all getting, you know, nice and technical. Uh, I hope you like it, but probably not everybody is, is going to give a bother delving into it in that depth. But again, these are concepts, and I hope I'm kind of bringing the concepts across rather than the math and code and stuff. Um, so there is, you know, there's two methods of reducing the overfitting, regularization, and cross-validation. Okay. And the slides will be available. In the, in the interest of time, I won't kind of go through it. But yeah, they're just to be aware that you know, we don't just naively kind of fit stuff. There, there are techniques that we developed, have been developed, and are used. And if they're not used, then, then the network doesn't train properly. It takes too long, or the result, the results aren't good. So just to be aware that these these techniques are used today to um, get the best results quicker, the quickest, the most accurate results. Okay, so how are we doing for time? Because I think I have, I'd like to leave five minutes at the end for questions. So six, right, I have about 15 minutes. Okay, so the feed forward network is the simplest type of neural network. Um, and it's simply that data comes in, goes through the network, and, and it comes out the output. Again, there's some nodes and layers, and they're all connected with. Uh, synapses, basically, these correspond to a different. That's the most simple type. It doesn't give good results anymore, but that's how we started off in the 50s with neural networks. Um, support vector machine, I put this in here for his, so we're just going through a few of the algorithms now. I put this in here for historical interest. Um, and uh, it's not a neural network, but up until um, neural networks, deep learning came along, the, these would give the best results in classification. So you, you know, you might come across the term support vector machine. You know, it sounds you know pretty amazing term, but um, it's a, it's a means of classifying. And this guy back neck who was at Royal Holloway actually when he did it came up with that. These things, um, you know, have been usurped essentially by deep learning algorithms. Okay, in fact, everything has been usurped, including us. The actual deep learning algorithms today run on the right um, processors and CPUs and GPUs. They can uh, outsee us, um, you know, they can classify images better than us, the human, you know, they're superhuman level today. That wasn't the case two years ago even, okay, three years ago, certainly not. Um, there's a graph which I should have included, which shows the accuracy against time. If you plot the time along here, suddenly in 2015, you have the human level uh, accuracy in image classification. Uh, the deep learning algorithm crosses that line, so it's now, you know, we're kind of out of distance in a, in a set in that small, very narrow field of AI. Uh, machines can classify images better than us. Yeah, they just process stuff. They see better than humans. So you kind of extrapolate and think, okay, if we can do this with sight, maybe we can do it with hearing, maybe we can do it with language understanding, and you go, okay, suddenly we, we will have machines that can read better than us, see better than us, and you, start to think, well, okay, you know, 
they're actually going to be more intelligent than us then. And then you start to think, okay, if they're more intelligent than us, they'll probably be able to do our jobs better than us, okay? It can read quicker and more accurately and make more sense than us. They're just superhuman. And so people are, you know, um, rightly so, thinking, okay, well, what are people going to do? Because, you know, these machines can be lawyers, they can be doctors, Watson is, you know, um, doing better image analysis and, you know, and lawyers can't, can only read a certain number of documents. These machines can read, I think, Watson can read 800 million documents a second or something like that. It's just, you know, you can't compete. And so once these algorithms are at the point where they can actually not just read them but understand them as well as us, it's kind of like it's all over, isn't it? So um, the solution becomes political. It's not a technology solution anymore. Okay, so, you know, these things are well on the way. Google's plowing a lot of money into this stuff, um, as all the other tech companies say, like Microsoft's my idea. And Google just won the go, right, for to one against Lisa Doll. Um, that, that was uh, a game, you know, that they thought would take about a decade to win when they started this a year ago, and already it's, it's won. So this stuff's happening really quick as well. Um, but again, you know, this isn't really a technological doubt. The solution to this problem is a technological one, it's a political one. So. It's uh, speak to your local MP, right? They probably don't even know this is happening just yet, but they will soon. So that's something that I know is on everybody's mind, and I like to bring it up because otherwise, you know, people are just they get scared. But I think you know the solution is a political one, and uh, it will be worked out. You know, for the sake of humanity, yeah. It's just that we have to figure it out, and we will. Confident we will be able to do that. Um, so that's a little bit of a detour. I'll come back to um, the algorithms. Um, so one of the things when we're training these algorithms to see better than we can and hear better than we can, um, we saw earlier. Uh, well, okay. So. Basically, yeah, so to train these guys, right, to train these things, you just got, they're, they're dumb machines, right? They don't, they're not self-aware like us. So how do we train the weights? Well, there's algorithms to do that too. One of them is, the most uh, common nowadays is gradient descent, in particular soft uh, stochastic gradient descent. Um, if you combine that with back propagation, whereby it, the information goes through the network, you compare the output, with uh, something, the ground truth, and you look at the difference, the delta, and then you propagate that back through each neuron and tweak the weights. And when the next uh, data comes in, uh, it will come through. And if, if that difference, if that delta is less, smaller, that's good. You, you leave it like that. If it's bigger, then you, you, you propagate back and you basically changing the weights through this back propagation algorithm will change the weights as it, as it propagates back and compares the difference between the input and the output and uh, so back propagation is the technique used to train these weights and get it to superhuman levels. I put something here on Markov models. Markov models were been around for a hundred years probably almost. Um, it's a similar thing so you've got the You've got this, it's a layered thing, you've got this um, basically hidden layers w w which are not visible and um, it's a similar process and basically, really, I, you know, I kind of put it in for historic purposes, okay. These things aren't really Markov models. People are kind of looking into, you know, how similar, how, if any of the techniques used in Markov models can be used in deep learning. Um, so far, you know, it's not really something, personally, my opinion is that they won't be needed at all, but I kind of put it in because up until a few years ago, Markov models were kind of hidden Markov models with a state of the art, but I think now with all, you know, the back propagation algorithms and stochastic gradient descent, these things will be seen as an approximation, if you like, to, to these deep learning algorithms. So that, this is historical and you can skip over it if you want. Okay, so we're coming up to the end of the concept. So 
Quickly, restricted Boltzmann machines and autoencoders. Restricted Boltzmann machines are simply two of those layers joined together in a particular way, which Jeff Hansen came up. Suddenly, it improved accuracy by five or ten percent, um, which is why they're important. Um, and you stack a bunch of these uh, layers together, and that's your neural network. These are just techniques. You can read the paper if you want. If you're mathematically inclined, um, you certainly can do that. If you're not, it will just be total gobbledygook. But um, these are papers that were written in 1999. The autoencoder uh, is when you make the input and the output layers the same. Uh, I'm just going to kind of skip over this stuff a little bit because um, we're running out of time. But uh, yeah, okay. So a couple more things there. Uh, yeah. Dropout, loss function, max pooling. Let's skip. I'm just going to skip that. You can read that in your own time because there's a little bit at the end I wanted to get to, which is probably more important to close the story. Convolutional neural networks, I mentioned, those are the vision uh, deep learning neural networks. Uh, recurrent neural networks are time series like speech, anything that's a sequence, um, which can be market data. Speech is a sequence, is a time series. Uh, code, you know, writing anything that's a set text is a sequence. Um, the interesting thing is that these neural networks now can actually generate uh, sequences, not just input and understand a sequence, like a sentence, but they can actually create sentences. So they're starting to write, write stories. And they're being used at the minute in journalism to write sports um, commentary, um, you know, basic stuff like that. They haven't, um, they can't write like fiction, good fiction yet, like Shakespeare, but these are all goals that, you know, it may sound weird, but yeah, they'll, they'll be picked off one by one, probably in the next two or three years. So we can expect to see, you know, these things actually generating stories and, and, and um, there is one that's, oh God, there's some comedy, American comedy, and uh, a series of like Friends or something. And they're just getting a whole bunch of them and throwing them into these recurrent neural networks. And they're basically producing comedy shows, right? Uh, there's another one where they feed cooking recipes into a, um, you know, a robot, basically. And the robot goes away and cooks it, right? Actually physically moves around the kitchen cooking it from that. So these are learning algorithms. They're general purpose learning algorithms. They start from scratch. They're not, they're just trained on data, just like we are as children, when our mum teaches us how to boil an egg, same thing. So using these recurrent neural networks, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's amazing, really, but pretty, pretty amazing stuff. So the state of the art, though, is LSTM, long short-term memory. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, how do we do it, really? How do we cook an egg, you know? We don't think about it, right? But people are starting to now, when we're, when we're building these things, you really have to understand how we how we teach a machine to cook an egg, right? So what's going on in terms of memory? How you know in terms of that sequence uh, when we learn, just learning from data, what's actually going on? What do we need to happen inside our brains, inside the machine? And it turns out memory is very important. We have something called working memory, which is about I think we can, you know, telephone number, we can, we can remember about seven or eight numbers that we can't anymore. And it, you, there's now and again you get super gifted autistic people who can look at a scene of London and paint every single building. Very rare. Um, that's because they've got more uh, working memory than, than normal people. And so we can build these machines now that have longer working memory. So that, that's how they become superhuman uh, levels because they, they, we can build them to have more short-term memory, if you like. These are the state-of-the-art machines. These are the machines that will produce novel shortly and, and uh, understand text. Um, and then this neural Turing machine, which DeepMind uh, came up with very recently, which uses uh, external memory as well. So yeah, basically, you know, the human brain has yeah, evolved, right, through evolution over billions of years. And, and, and it's evolved to what it is, but we can actually take that process over now, and we are, and we're actually building stuff with different types of setup. Although we're using the same architecture, we can give it more short-term memory. We can do we can do different things. So we, that's how we're building these things that can see better than us and, and understand things better than us. Okay, which yeah, evolution has done a pretty amazing job, right? But 
um, it's sort of we're taking over from evolution and uh, building it uh, you know, from the ground up, if you like, these companies like DeepMind. Their mission is to solve intelligence. And if they solve intelligence, then they can solve every other problem too. They can become scientists, they can unify the theories of physics, they can, you know, sort out, you know, world poverty, you know, they can do whatever problem that's outstanding, pretty much. That is the goal of DeepMind, and that, that's actually a serious goal of DeepMind, you know, in the next five to ten years. So, finally, the actual framework. What do these things look like? Well, we can go on to the, these are open source, so they're available to anybody. If anybody's interested, some of you may have already done this, you can go to these sites and download the software onto your uh, Mac or your uh, Linux machine. Uh, some will run on Windows, most of them are Linux based, and you can throw data at them. You can go to the MNIST uh, data set and load it into these frameworks and you can do some analysis tonight. I mean, you know, this stuff is in mystery magic. This is here now, you can use it. These companies like Google and Microsoft have very generously open sourced all of their deep learning frameworks. Uh, not so generous because uh, they know that the more people that use them, uh, doing, you know, university, and then the three or four years time when they graduate, they'll be ready to go and work at Google because they've had four years of experience using these open source frameworks. So they all made a decision at the end of last year to open source all of their deep learning frameworks, which were closely guarded secrets until that point. And I, th I see that as a point where the world changed because now you and I can go home and use the same algorithms that Google use, right, and Microsoft use. Uh, IBM use to, you know, generate all their revenue okay. and use those same algorithms. But it's not completely altruistic because if we're doing that and getting really good at them, uh, then, you know, it's, it's good for those companies. That, is, um, that was thinking behind it. But yeah, they really did open source all of this stuff last year and that was a big deal. I think, in to, you know, in the big, big picture and kind of historic that that happened. I was very surprised when that happened, but it's, it's, it's happened. So, here's some more. Um, you can go and look at these, some specific ones, CNNs, RNNs, LSTMs, you can download them, throw data at them, and see what they do. Okay, finally, last three slides. Last three slides, have I got? Okay, a couple of minutes. Um, so, TensorFlow, uh, Torch and Tianu, the th three of the more popular ones. TensorFlow is one Google open source last year in November. After that, about six companies, including Samsung, IBM, and Microsoft, downloaded uh, open source service like the next day. Um, TensorFlow is a popular one, it's written in C. You can download it at tensorflow.org. Torch has been around since 2000. Facebook uses it, Google uses it as well as their own. Um, started off in the Swiss Institute there. And lastly, Theano is a Python based one, which is nice. Python is kind of a user friendly language if you come from a data science background in particular. And um, yeah, that, that's, that's a good one to start with also. So these three are kind of like the main ones, but you, you have a whole bunch to choose from, to be honest. This, yeah, they've all got their own strengths and weaknesses. Um, there's a comparison. What we look for when we compare them, and I'll finish here, is um, those sorts of things, you know, um, do they run on a single machine? Are they, can you run it on a cluster? If they can run on a cluster, you can do more with it, you can throw more data with it, edit and do it more quickly, do the analysis more quickly. And yeah, there's different metrics we use there. So I'll end there. Um, do I have time for a question? Or? Yeah, okay, a couple of questions. So I'm gonna end there um, and just open up the floor for a couple of questions before Ian, yeah? Do you use and why? Yeah, uh, I've I started with Theano, but now that Google open source TensorFlow, I've been looking at that. Yeah, I'm no expert, but that's why I'm kind of curious to see how that performs uh, relative to Theano. Uh, Theano is in Python, I'm more familiar with Python than C. So, but yeah, it's a good excuse to learn another language. Yeah. Apart from facial recognition, what's the biggest, like, um, like Consumer use of deep learning at the moment? Yeah, that's a good question. Everything. Okay. 
Yeah, I'll answer this. Google are using it in a hundred different products, so just anything. Language translation. Basically, the two things are language and, and vision, I think, okay, um, and also video as well. So anything that you can use, uh, anything that involves language or um, vision. So with vision, it's classification, it's object classification. Um, with with language, it's translation, and uh, yeah, any 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 application you can think of that we do with language and, and vision, uh, that the machines can do it now. Machine intelligence, yeah. So it's it's not really limited. It's like what what can't you do with it? I mean, that that really is the question. I think. Yeah. One more. Okay, that's it. Yeah, good. I think I'll hand it over to Ian now. Thanks.